hand over to uh, Jenny, who is uh, going to take us away. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I'm sorry I'm sitting down because I twisted my knee earlier, and if I stand up, then I will hurt myself, so I'm sorry about that. I will try and give energy through waving my arms around even more than I usually do. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Jenny. I'm CEO at the Open Data Institute, which uh, has a, is a not-for-profit with a mission to build an open and trustworthy data ecosystem based in London. But what I'm going to talk about um, today actually builds on, some, builds on stuff that I started before ODI, um, and uh, some, yeah, so I'm kind of going to take you back in time um, to the next slide. In 2006-ish, which I can talk about instead. Um, so around 2006, 2007, 2008 kind of time, I can't really remember because my memory is really, really bad. Uh, I do remember having a dinner with a colleague of mine that I'd been working with for a, a year or so by the name of John Sheridan. Um, uh, John was, uh, thank you for a uh, slide change, um, in, in, a, in a nice Italian restaurant near Charing Cross Station, from what I recall. John started telling me about the um, challenge that he was going to be having coming up um, around taking on the publication of legislation. Now, the legislation, um, the legislation database, uh, the statute law database, was at that time um, managed by the Department for Constitutional Affairs, now known as the MOJ, Ministry of Justice, um, and they maintained uh, a copy of revised legislation for the UK. Now, when democracy and parliament and all of that kind of stuff is working properly, this is how things work. Um, parliament makes laws. The laws that parliament makes, the acts that they make, contain within them changes to previous laws, amendments to previous laws. Um, so you can work out what our current law that affects us right now is by looking at all of the laws that have ever passed and kind of building up in your head how they must have changed and all those kinds of things. But it's much more convenient if you can look at a piece of legislation that might have been passed 20 years ago, but how it looks now because of all the changes that have been made to it over time. Does that make sense? Um, so we have, a, we have a situation where we have a, um, our, our legal, uh, the laws that we live under are constantly changing because of amendments that are made by other laws. The statute law database back in 2006 or 2008 when, we, when it was first kind of uh, published online, made available, was uh, only about 50% of the acts that were in that database were actually up to date. So you could look at an act and you could find out um, what it looked like you know, several years ago and then see all of the changes that have been made to it since, but you'd still have to do that in your head. They couldn't get the database up to date to in include um, so, so that you could actually look at the law as it was that day. Not only that, but because Parliament was functioning at the time, they were passing lots of new laws... Um, such that around 15,000 amendments were being made every year. 15,000 changes that needed to be applied on, on existing legislation. And the team that were trying to uh, um, maintain that, that current legislation were only able in a year to apply about 10,000 effects. So 15,000 being made by Parliament, about 10,000 being able to be applied by the team. In other words, it was, a, a, it was a database that was not only out of date already, but also was getting worse and worse, more and more out of date over time. So John, in this, in this, in this conversation, um, proposed a solution to this, proposed a way of getting around this um, that we could develop together, he thought. Um, I want 
put this picture up, which is a classic picture of John. John's there on the, on the right. And somebody listening to John, this is actually my friend Ellen listening to John, not me. Um, this is the usual face that you have when you're listening to John and one of his kind of weird ideas. And this was definitely the face that I had when I was listening to John. What he said was, look, we can publish data, we can publish legislation openly, but not only that, we can get other people to help us maintain it. Not only the team that is in the Ministry of Justice maintaining it, but also people who are uh, in the private sector who are currently doing the work anyway. They can maintain it too. We could get we could get lawyers to maintain it we can get students to maintain it all we have to do is make it open and set it up so that they can maintain it too um, so basically he was saying take at, at the time open data if you if you thought about open data particularly from government it was much more around government will publish open data for you and you will consume it what John was describing was a more open source model that we have with code, where um, when, something, when something is published, lots of other people can maintain it as well. And that's how we get the real value out of open source. He was positing to me that that was also how we could get the real value out of open data um, and be, be able to use it to tackle this really difficult problem about keeping and updating a data set. Um, I thought he was pretty mad, right? Um, but, you know, as with a lot of John's schemes, I just kind of went along with it. And, of course, it wasn't um, the only kind of scheme to, to try to maintain data in a kind of open source way. OpenStreetMap have actually been launched a few years previously, so that's a kind of wiki approach to maintaining very strong geospatial data infrastructure, information about the physical environment that we live in. Um, and you can see some of the features of a really good collaborative maintenance project within OpenStreetMap here, looking just at this road um, out the front here, you can see who last changed it, what changes have been made to it over time, you can see how it's linked to other things, you can see how it's classified, it's all structured in a very formal way, it's also in OpenStreetMap one that can be amended, that's the, even that structure about how the data works can be amended a little bit over time. Um, and there are other things like Discogs, um, which is another collaboratively maintained data set, again launched uh, initially in the early 2000s um, to maintain data and collect data for everybody to benefit from about music, about albums, uh, and so on. What was really different about legislation, though, was that these are these are things that you can maintain with with wikis, and you don't it it doesn't really matter who edits them, and somebody else can adjust it if it's wrong, and all those kinds of things. You can't really do that with law, right? The, the law that gets published it has to be accurate, otherwise bad things might happen. Um, so we needed different kinds of ways to manage the maintenance of of legislation and manage how it what kinds of changes were could be made to it and who could make those changes um, than you could for these more open collaborative models. Um, but the idea was that we could get all these kinds of benefits. These are the ones actually that, that come out of the, the research that we've been doing more recently. These are why people collaborate around, around data. We could reduce costs. With legislation, then... Um, at the time, then not only the, the uh, Ministry of Justice uh, or Department for Constitutional Affairs, but, um, but also lots of private sector suppliers were all maintaining exactly the same data set based on exactly the same information. It's a waste of time and effort when that is being repeated. Um, and we could re reduce costs across the whole system, not just for the people within MOJ, but also those um, outside it. We thought we could improve data quality by having more eyes on it, as Tom really eloquently talked about earlier. Um, in, in other kinds of cases, we can improve through, um, through collaborating. We can improve coverage and currency in what there is. So, so for legislation, obviously, currency was an issue. We could get the changes done much more rapidly if we have more people collaborating on it. But also, if you look at, say, the way that OpenStreetMap works, um, the data that we get out of OpenStreetMap is much more up-to-date to changes on the ground than data that we can get out of the more formal surveying methods that are employed by, open, uh, by um, Ordnance Survey. 
In other cases, when you're collaborating, then you can draw on wider expertise. It, it becomes a much richer community that can be contributing towards data, and that means people with different expertise. And the fact that you're collaborating, the fact that others are, um, are part, that, that, that people know that you have this data set that you're looking after, and that you're maintaining with other people, that you have structures around how it's updated, all of those things mean that you can increase the trust in that data, that it's a reliable asset, that other people can rely on it too, because they're also part of it, um, and they know that, that it's not, um, not going to dwindle and die, as some of the talks earlier on uh, kind of alluded to. So, so collaborating over data assets can give all of these kinds of advantages. Um, but it's quite hard to set up those kinds of projects and those kinds of pieces of work. Um, as I said, I think that the conversation with John that I initially had was around 2008's kind of time. I think it took us about four years. Um, some of that was publishing, just publishing legislation on the website, but a lot of it was the stuff behind the scenes to help people manage actually editing legislation, to manage the tasks that were involved, to manage the review processes, and putting the right kinds of structures and, uh, and, and implementation in place in order to make that work. So it's hard to do. How, how do you get to, to um, having a, a, a good, well-maintained, collaboratively maintained data asset. Well, that was the focus of a piece of work that, yes, launching um, actually went online yesterday, but it was particularly in time for this conference, a um, piece of work that we've been doing at ODI over the past uh, year or so, specifically looking at collaborative data maintenance. We've been, we've been going and looking at, and I say we, the team, because I don't get to do fun stuff anymore. The team have been going and looking at a huge number of different kinds of collaboratively maintained data sets and, da and, and data initiatives, examining the kinds of processes and practices and interfaces that they have within them, and then pulling out from that a number of different patterns that you can use in, or in your own projects when you are building collaboratively maintained data sets. And the goal is that you don't have to you know, um, just experiment on your own. You can see what has worked in other places and the kinds of things that have worked. And that should, we hope, make it easier for you guys if you want to collaboratively maintain data to set up the systems that help you to do that. So as an example, the patterns that have kind of come out um, there's a pattern that is about maintaining a change set. So making sure that you have that as, a, uh, as entities, changes as entities that can be talked about and reasoned about. There's um, a whole bunch of patterns about how to maintain quality, including things about moderation and review processes, which are the kinds of things that um, we certainly needed to use in legislation, Gov UK. Um, whoops. Just losing my place, sorry. Um, when the, when the team looked at these different kinds of um, collaboration sites, they found a few different categories. So things like when there's a bunch of tasks that need to be managed, in order, like, like looking at images, for example, that need some human interventions, but also things like, um, collecting, uh, things like producing a directory. So when you want to get a, a big directory of, say, all businesses or all organizations in a particular space or uh, with a particular focus. Getting more people involved in collecting those is one way of ensuring that you get a higher quality, more accurate, more up-to-date data set. Um, one of the things that I think is most important about that is that um, although, say with legislation and that open source model, being open was part of the point of it because the, by, by maintaining the openness of the data, that would give the motivation for people to be involved in maintaining it, that they could benefit from the changes that have been made as well. Um, but one of the things that we found was that these patterns can also work inside an organization, um, even when the data is on the closed end of the spectrum. If you're still, a lot of data maintenance actually, even inside an organization, involves multiple people. And so some of these patterns, many of these patterns can also apply even if you're in a much more closed environment where you're, you're maintaining data internally. 
Um, they cover, the patterns cover things about data model, editing quality, workflows, managing conflict, um, governance, community management, which of course is really important when you've got an external community that you're trying to get, uh, get involved and um, have some say over the way in which the project goes, how to encourage contributions and the different kind of project types that we've found. Um, and it also has a kind of walkthrough of, uh, say you were doing this kind of maintenance, this kind of collaborative data maintenance project, here's how you could use the patterns to help inform the way, the way it's designed. Um, and it's something you can contribute to as well. So there's a page that describes how you can go and edit the pages or produce your own patterns and hopefully get this maintained as something that we can all benefit from. So just to wrap up, um, where are we now with legislation? I mean, 2012, when we started it, that was when I left and went to ODI. Um, so I can really claim absolutely no credit for the fact that now um, it's at 99% completion. 99% of the acts that are there are fully up to date. Of course, it helps when Parliament doesn't make any acts, but 99% up to date. Um, I, and so much so that the team is now going on to modify the statutory instruments, which were never things that they thought that they could keep up to date. Um, they were only focused on acts. So they're, they're expanding their scope because they're able to do so much more. Nowadays, it's more like 5,000 effects a month that they can do, not rather than the 10,000 over a year that they could do. Um, way back when. And they have, over time, there have been 27 different collaborators that have been uh, in collaborating institutions that have been um, putting uh, effort into maintaining legislation. So it can really work. It takes time. It takes time to build. It takes time to get the, the efforts going through. Um, but I just wanted to encourage you all to uh, collaborate over your data. If you want to find out more, collaborativedata.theodi.org is that pattern catalogue. And if you want to find more, out more about the legislation case study, there's one from a couple of years ago that's written up at that URL there. Thank you very much.